all the time, but I do enjoy being an introvert where I just sit around and read or I do my research and no one talks to me and I can literally be quiet and alone for hours and hours and hours. Um, and oddly enough, it's therapeutic for me. It helps me clear my mind. I'm focused on things that I really enjoy. Um, it's similar to meditation, which I also do every day. And it just helps to clear your mind. If we teach our children some of these skills, they will continue, most of the time, they will continue these very positive behaviors because it does release dopamine in the brain. They do want to go back and relive that feeling. We have, I mean, I know some of the students who were in our um, our, tri our clinical trial on in using yoga as the intervention for children who had undesirable behaviors displayed throughout the day. Um, they still continue that yoga practice. Now, do they do full yoga every single day? No. But when they find themselves being overwhelmed with life or things aren't going their way or they're about to lash out, they will stop what they're doing. They will do the deep breathing in through the mouth, out through the nose. Um, if we're trying to release heat, if we're trying to, you know, cool our bodies down, we breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, which releases that heat. Um, those type of things are very powerful. Many of these, many of these children who grow up to be serial killers or violent offenders, they never had silence in their life. We know that families who are economically, socioeconomically challenged, um, their homes are usually very noisy. People come and go. You see a lot of um, discourse among the family. There's always fighting. There's, it's always loud and boisterous. Um, the TV is typically always on blaring and it's just for background noise. There's very few people ever sitting down watching the TV, but it's always a back noise, right? So silence for them is golden. Um, have you ever sat in your vehicle on your way, like driving back from work, driving home from work or driving to work or and you just don't even want to hear the radio. You just, everything's turned off and you're driving and it's just complete silence. And that is a way for your body to revive itself and to just be in the moment and not hear constant noises. And that, that in and of itself is incredibly therapeutic, but we can do that as well. Um, at the end of, of yoga, we always do Shavasana, which is, you know, the corpse pose where we lay on our back. <clears throat> Arms can be down by your side or, you know, crossed on your chest or however you feel comfortable when you're lying completely still. Your legs are completely released. Typically your feet, your ankles, they turn to the side because you want to release all that tension. So you're doing nothing but in your mind, you imagine that you're melting into your yoga mat. You're melting into the floor. And we have all these visuals that we talk about when we're doing our meditation. Um, I don't want to call it a chant because it's not a chant, but it's like a, it's like something that we read, getting you to hyper focus on your body. Um, and that is so powerful. They do that in prison, of course. Um, and it's one of their most successful programs nationwide is implementing yoga into prisons, not necessarily for rehabilitation. It is a part of rehabilitation, but it, it helps them. It helps these violent offenders stop and think about what they're doing. And before they make these actions or do these actions, they have that moment of peace that they can sit around and and maybe make a better decision. It, it's going to be a little bit different when you've got people who are schizophrenic and are not taking their medication because they don't think clearly. They don't have that ability to think through things and talk their way through things in their mind. You know, self-talk is very powerful. Um, I talk to myself all the time. It drives Kevin nuts. Um, but I'll be working on something and I'll be like, no, that's not right. Let me go back and look at this. And and he's like, what? <laughs> what? 
what what I'm doing is that just helps me in my mind clear out that clutter and I'm, it helps me focus. So for me, self-talk is um, therapeutic. It helps me focus. It helps me get tasks completed. It's just really powerful. And uh, those are some things that we can teach our youngest children and they'll continue. Many of them can continue to use it all through their lifespan which is what we want, right? We want to give them positive alternatives to their behavior. Instead of doing this, let's do this. Instead of doing that, let's try this first. Um, again, that's that's that attributional retraining that Aber talks about. It can be done. It can be done, but the earlier the better. The earlier we get to our children and we implement these interventions, the more success we're gonna have down the road. I think it's very powerful that we that we look for these extreme cases of childhood trauma and we implement these incredibly strong and consistent coping mechanisms to these children. Um, I feel like every everyone who's in a classroom with a child, no matter what their age, even into high school, even into college, we need to be teaching these coping skills because life is hard. You know, if you're completely average and you have an average job and an average life and an average home, life is still difficult. And so having these alternatives helps us all to be better people in the long run and make a positive contribution to the world. Right. So for me, uh, that's very, very powerful. Um, now, they did, of course, conduct interviews with Chase when he was in prison, like they all do. Um, most all criminals of this magnitude get interviewed by multiple psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, and what they did find was he did say, he did say that his parents were abusive towards him and as... Um, he admitted that as he progressed toward his preteen years, he exhibited the signs of that McDonald triad. I'm positive he didn't say, well, I exhibited the signs of the McDonald triad. No. I'm sure he said, well, I like to kill animals. I like, you know, I had this issue where I wet my bed all the time. And then I also like to, um, well, in his case, drink blood. You know, he hit the three most common signs in the McDonald triad. And of course, you know, if you've listened to this, you know that there are many other characteristics in that McDonald um, checklist, if you will, but the triad are the top three. Um, and so those are literally just, it's just a tool to help us identify. Not all kids who wet the bed, not all kids who like hurting animals, uh, etc. are going to be serial killers. But that's a bad sign right from the start. That tells me they need help to whatever degree it is they're doing these things. So we, I think we have to have not, I think we should not only have like children with IEPs where we refer them to or we need, they, we think they need IEPs because of a developmental delay or or something. There's a deficit somewhere, and I don't like saying it that way, but that's what it is. Um, I think we need the same with social-emotional. We need a social-emotional counselor in every single school. We need a process to which, you know, children are referred to this, you know, specialist, and they get as much intensive um, interventions as they can while at school because we have them longer than we have them longer during their waking hours than typically the parents or the guardians do so we have that opportunity and yes we're also trying to teach them academics but you cannot learn if your basic needs aren't met and these children are children whose basic needs are not being met whether it be lack of food lack of um, affection uh, attachment to the family, to the parents, particularly the mother. They're lacking in all these major areas in their life. And so we can intervene at some level in the school system. 
I know we don't make enough money for what we already do, but this is how crucial it is for us as educators to recognize what power we have in changing the world, even if it's one child at a time, even if it's only one child during your entire career. What have you done to change their life for the better? I don't ever want anybody, I don't ever want to be in a classroom or be called to a classroom where that teacher blames themselves for a child who has already done something that removes them from society, whether it be starting a fire, burning a house down, torturing animals, even moving that torture to, you know, vulnerable humans like younger children, younger siblings, um, people in the, you know, children in their own neighborhood that they can overpower. It happens and we have to be real about it. So what we're the ones that have the opportunity to make a difference. That's why this is so critical. Um, I think it's interesting that Chase became a hypochondriac. That's part of that schizophrenia. That's part of that you know, not being able to trust others or trust anything around him. I'm sure he was um, delusional uh, in many ways. And of course, him taking drugs like LSD, uh, consuming alcohol, smoking marijuana, that did not help the situation, obviously. It, it likely only heightened his awareness of his differences as well as his desires to to kill and mutilate victims um and again i there's so much that we've seen about the most popular or infamous serial killers like Dahmer and so forth but those do not I don't want to say that they don't compare, but in many ways they don't compare. Uh, Dahmer was a, was horrible. I mean, the things that he did, he was a cannibal. He was into necrophilia. He was into control because he wanted people to stay with him. But he was not torturous towards his victims. He didn't torture them. Um... You know, Richard Chase was an exceptionally violent human being. Um, and the things that he did were not even, I would even put in a category of subhuman. What he did was animalistic. It's the kind of killings, mutilation, torture that you would see like from a lion attacking a human. He had this fixation about blood. Don't know why. I mean, I don't know what that what that drive was about. That's probably something I need to research just for my own curiosity. What is it about that? What is it about the blood that he was so obsessed with? Did he see that as this is their life blood flowing? Um, I control their life because I control their blood flow. I I can. I can definitely see that. I can see him thinking in that way. Um, you know, blood's powerful. If we don't have blood, we're dead, right? Just like if we don't have our, many, many of our organs are absolutely necessary for us to live. You can live without a few of them. Um, but the majority, your heart, your lungs, you you can't live without them. So, you know, he removed body parts. He removed blood. And stored it. He soaked all of his belongings in this blood. Um, what was it about that blood that was, what happened in his childhood that caused him to fixate on blood? That, that is what he's known for. That's why he's called the vampire. The blood was his thing. Um, again, can't find any reports that that there was something in his early childhood that triggered that, you know, it can be the color, it can be the smell, it can be the, the what, you know, the thickness of the blood or the liquidity of the blood, all those things. 
he, we don't know that. And of course, he's dead now, so we won't ever know it. We can make some assumptions about it, which might help us 